I want to say thank you to all the new students who uh, wanted to check this out. Uh, I can only tell you one class is, is only just a checkout. And, um, you know, um, Emma, I'm going to ask you one question. If you can just turn, when you look at the computer, you're looking off screen and you should be looking directly onto the screen or I don't see your eyes directly. So that, that helps. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I met Rudy, you, you all know this, well, most of you know the story. Uh, I had gone around the world looking for a teacher and uh, and didn't find one. And I literally crossed the globe and four blocks away from where I left was Rudy's store. And I walked in there to sell him some Tibetan carpets that I had gotten from monks in Kathmandu that needed money to survive. And he was not interested in the carpets, but he told me where to go to sell them. And of course, uh, they sold just fine. But he asked what I was doing in Kathmandu and all of that. And I said, I went to find, look for a teacher. And he said, did you find one? I said, no. And he said, well, you know, I can teach you everything you want to know. And you know, he's this big cherub, but large character sitting in an antique store. And I had every reason in the world to question his authenticity. But nothing in me questioned it at all. Not for a second. I knew, I just knew that I had found the person I was looking for. And when you do find the person you're looking for, you will more than likely know. He took me outside, sat me on the <clears throat> subway grate on a uh, folding chair, and he sat opposite me on 7th Avenue in the village in New York. And he proceeded to teach me the uh, exercise that I've given all of you online now. Not quite the same thing as in-person, one-on-one, especially with Rudy. But uh, I just, and he did it in three minutes for whatever that's worth. But I just went, it's really strange, very strange. I never had anybody look at me like that. But I, I offered to, um, to, to go to his class, which was a few nights later. The story, as you've all heard it, is that same night, I believe, I met my wife. So that's a whole other part of an amazing day. <clears throat> but I did go to his class, which was taught in a former mortuary. <laughs> and and uh, he sat where they, where they used to display the coffins. I didn't know that. And I'm sitting in a chair. Uh, it's on Hudson Street in New York, right off Greenwich, uh, uh, Bleecker Street, actually. And you know, Christopher Street. And I, I'm sitting there, and he sits down, he takes his shirt off. I didn't go, okay, uh, I'm not taking my shirt off, so you don't have to worry about that. But he did took his shirt off, and he sat there, and he started to look at everyone in the room. And there were probably 30 of us, something like that. And when he looked at me, I, my body jerked like this, and I fell flat on the floor. I had never had anybody look at me and cause me to fall flat on the floor. That is a measurement that worked. I just knew whatever he's doing speaks to me. I don't know that I cause anybody to fall flat on the floor. And I don't think I have the dynamic of energy that Rudy uh, presented. One of the reasons I think I'm still here teaching is because he presented me with a flow of energy that was unlike anything I've ever experienced in the world. And it's still flowing. And it's gone deeper and deeper and deeper. And part of its extraordinary aspect is it doesn't make you more of a teacher or more of a person. It makes you less of both and more of a vehicle or a vessel for something that just flows. And if you are in touch with that flow, as some of you who are sitting here today have been now taught how to open to that, and it works for you, you're welcome back. If you had tasted this today and you go, eh, not for me, not a big deal, because the right person will show up. The right person will appear. I don't care if it's me. I don't care who it is. I just know if you are sincere in your pursuit of what they call awakening, enlightenment, opening, consciousness, attunement, whatever you want to call it, if you're in pursuit of that, go look. Go everywhere. Go wherever you have to go. Be careful, though, because the judge, the judge of that tends to be your brain and your mind 
which has been taught since childhood to be the arbiter of what's right and wrong. And what we're trying to teach in this class is that is not the best arbiter of truth. It is only a perception of a materialized world and it makes sense of that space. But the real perception is somewhere deep within. And only by going inside into this heart space, into the chakra, can you begin to find this um, aha. And you all know it. You've all felt it somewhere along the way. This moment of, huh, I get it. It's not a getting it mentally, emotionally. It's just a kind of like, you know, like walking through the door of a house and going, that's where I want to live. It has that kind of knowing, that kind of presence. And if you feel that, or if you feel maybe it could become that, you're welcome to sit here week after week, as often as you like. And I will do my best to draw this energy that Rudy opened up to me, which sometimes has unbelievable flooding aspect and sometimes is very gentle and very particular and specific. But it knows beyond my understanding what to do with every person in front of me. And it just gives that energy to the people around me who want it. I don't take any ownership of this at all. If anything, I'm the impediment. I'm the thing in the way. And so my whole job as a teacher is get out of the way. Just let go of the name and the person and the history of this Bruce guy and let this thing come in. And luckily, over the course of 60 years of doing this, Bruce has gotten more and more, if you will, diminished, scrubbed away through multiple processes. One of them is meditative. Another was career. <coughs> Excuse me, having children. <laughs> There's all these things that start to diminish you on some level. You're just not worthy enough or able enough or whatever. But then this energy comes in and it is perfect in itself. And this energy comes in and it does what it needs to do. And if you're awake and alert at all, you know it's not you. It is not you. All you are is the doorway. You've turned the handle, you've opened the door, and you've said, come in, or it said, come in to you, and you walked inside to this spacious, exquisite place of being that is there for everyone. There is no one in the, hu the entire human race who doesn't have this space in them. And some doors open easily. Some doors are an unbelievably difficult process. There's this thing called karma. Do I understand karma? I don't, except I see it around me all the time. I see people who have particularly easy paths and people who have really difficult paths. Do I judge it? No. I just know that <clears throat> some people with the most difficult paths have the most opening, and some people with the easiest paths don't even come close. Kind of an interesting observation. But if you're on the journey to awakening, you will discover the difficult parts. You, excuse me. You will discover the um, the parts in yourself that are really uh, needy, wanting, scared, uh, unaddressed, invisible. They will come into play. And when they come into play, if you have a deeply open heart, a gut that can take on anything in the world, and you allow all of this stuff to show itself, you become deeply aware and deeply content with this being that is within you. And it is both you and not you. It is so beyond you. It's really like a blade of grass experiencing itself as part of the lawn. You know, the, it's this amazing thing. It's so beautiful. It's so expansive. Or the drop of water in the ocean suddenly knowing, oh, ocean. I am a drop, but you know that drop dissolves. And what happens? It goes right back to where it came from, which was where we all come from, this oceanic reality of our being. Now, nothing I'm saying here is new. And there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of teachers saying everything I'm saying to you. And if they speak to you in a way that goes in more deeply or more profoundly or or touches a, a note or a place in yourself that is so vulnerable and open, go there, go there. I, I know I'm not 
<clears throat> I have no way trying to tell you this is the path. I can only tell you it has been an amazing path for me and my journey, for my wife Blanche and her journey, for the people sitting around me who have been coming to class for decades and decades, and for those of you who have had the same thing. This is a constant. It is a renewable space, if you want to call it that. It's also a challenging space and a deepening space. You can use it any way you want. In this lifetime, you can use it just to walk four steps that you wouldn't have walked otherwise, or you can walk miles, or you can travel into the infinite realms of the universe. Kind of your call. It's what, what do you want out of all of this? And part of it is the ego wants what? Comfort, security, lack of stress, lack of suffering, a kind of knowing. And it's capable of providing much of that. If you want, maybe you can say all of that. But the only problem in all of that comfort and lack of stress and anxiety is it's temporary. It's temporary because we are temporary. And because our temporariness is going to begin to unfold for us in a very big way along the journey, maybe suddenly, maybe at the end of the ride. But one way or another, you get to go and you go, this is only a, it's only a time-based experience. It has beginning, middle, and an end. And your desire for comfort and security during it is fine, except that it's going to be challenged by the sudden awareness that your time is up. I have a dear friend, a dear friend who discovered this week that he had a, um, a blastoma tumor in his brain and a life challenging, more than life challenging, life ending experience. He's too young for that, too young. But if there's ever been anyone I've ever known who's ready because he's been a a part of this world for a very long time and a giver of love to so many people, he is ready. And I, I wrote him a note the other day and I said, the, the last line of, of my film Ghost is the love inside, you take it with you. And I said, you know, you're going to need a freight train. There's so much love inside you that there's no way that you can just put it in your hand and leave this world. There's something to arrive at that space in a lifetime of giving and loving and caring that allows you to have that kind of departure, if you will. But most of us do not do not prepare that way. We live our life as though if we can just get rid of the headache today, we're going to be fine. Or if we just get rid of the fear and anxiety of today, we're fine. The reality is this is a massive, <laughs> massive undertaking more than anybody can imagine. And, you know, I've, the, the, the web, the, the podcast that I was on that, uh, um, next level soul that a pretty large number of people watched and which brought a lot of new people, I think, to this class. Um, there's so many people on that show. And if you listen to them, a fair number of them kind of get it, or, or, or at least they talk it. They, they talk the entire idea of how the world works and all the dimensionalities of life. And when you get to this point, you get this dimension and then that dimension. And I don't know that they're wrong. I have, I don't, I don't, it's not the way my journey has gone. But the only thing I question for everybody is the certainty of trying to express it as this is how it is. My sense is we don't know. We really don't know, at least not cognitively. It's really fascinating. We just, we don't have the answers and we're trying to get them. And I read this article in the New Yorker the other day about the top thinkers in the field of AI in America, artificial intelligence. And it was terrifying <laughs> because they all sounded like the kids I went to college with. And we were all sitting around the table talking about what life is and what life isn't and how this is gonna work and how it was all with enormous authority. And we all had such brilliant things to say. Well, these kids are now in their 30s and 40s. They still sit around and talk in the same way. And they are building these unbelievable systems of artificial intelligence with the same kind of naivete and juice, if you will, and excitement that I knew in my, high, in my college years, let's say. But I'm going, oh, my God, whose hands are we in here? 
with this unfolding of energy that is in many ways directed by mind, lots of people's minds and their young minds and their excited minds. And half of them are terrified of where this is going and half of them think it's the best thing ever. And there's no complete meeting of the minds because there never is on the planet Earth because we are a yin yang society, a positive negative universe. But I realized what is running the show in all of this is not our minds and it's not us. There's this much deeper knowing that goes through the heart and through the belly, the gut, and then also through the mind, if you can align it all. And that powerful knowing comes through and you begin to look at life in a completely new way. But it means you stop looking at the outer world as the totality and you turn your attention in and begin the journey into this infinite, unbelievable realm of being. And that's what we're doing right here. You guys are sitting here in the weirdest way possible on a computer screen in a Zoom class, which never, ever would have occurred to Rudy, that's for sure. But once COVID happened, that was the only way to dialogue and to have a class with other people. What's so extraordinary is that it works. I cannot tell you how, and I cannot tell you why, but I know the energy goes through the screen, through the ether, into the infinite space around us and into your mind-body complex, and you get it. And I can see it when it goes in. You know, it's really fascinating because a lot of you don't know when I'm working with you exactly. There's no particular way to know. But so often, there's an energy moment that the person I'm working with gets, even though they have no idea that they're exactly the one on the screen who's being worked with. It is a kind of mystical, magical reality of energy transformation that occurs in a dialogue between souls that are connected beyond time and space through this infinite awareness that we all share and participate in. We are not even separated in it. We are co-joined. We are one in that space. Here in the material world, yes, we are all these varying kinds of individualized entities. But the reality is, no, we are a singular manifestation. And it is completely beautiful and gets deeper by the day. I, uh, <clears throat> I've been having this experience with, I will call it altered consciousness, higher consciousness, otherness. <laughs> and I'll, I'll explain it. I, I, I do a walk around my house every morning. I have a perimeter around my inside of my house that allows me to actually walk two miles in, a, in, a, in the morning in about an hour, a little less. And it goes by all these things that I love, which are pictures and paintings and pottery that Blanche made and gifts that people have given us, but also plants everywhere. And there's a new plant and it's called a, uh, whatever it's called. Okay, what Blanche's memory and my memory are going, but there's this plant that, Adalia, Adalia thank you, that was in full bloom here about a year or so ago and then died off, but the bloom was beyond belief. And the dahlia has gone back into, into a tub, tubular space. And Blanche keeps watering it like she's hoping something will happen. And this is like for over a year. And this dahlia just sits there in this you know tube, like, like probably dead in my mind. But I walk around it every day and look at it. And then suddenly in the last um, few weeks, this green sprout is coming out of it. It's just opening and opening. And the other day, I'm walking by it, and something said, touch me. And I went, okay. I touched the dahlia, the green sprout coming up. And it was like the most profound class, other than Rudy, that I've ever had. The dahlia just spoke to me. It just, it said, thank you for touching me. Thank you for connecting. Thank you for honoring me. Thank you for growing me. It was like, it was a communion between others and other species, but it was so strong. It was so vibrant and it continues every day because now I touch it every day. So with great gentility and it is like talking to um, creatures beyond our understanding. And yet it's right here. It's right here in our library. And I go, how did I miss this? 
my entire life, I have walked around with plants everywhere. And I haven't, I mean, I've helped water them and things like that, but I've never stopped to dialogue. Nor did I imagine there was a dialogue. And the dialogue with one plant has opened me up to the dialogue with every growing thing. And of course, we all know from the psychedelic realm and other realms that the earth is a dialogue with all of the planted things that are in the ground, talking to one another through mold, through mushrooms. There's a there's a kind of a web of connection. And I've read about that and I kind of feel that. But I have to say, this was the first time I literally touched it. And that has changed me because now every blade of grass has its own its own awareness. And I started driving the other day in these massive fields and massive great blades of grass everywhere. And I decided to dialogue like with one blade of grass. And it 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 had such a sense of aloneness. It did not understand why it died every year and grew back. It did not understand the process. It didn't know why these blades came and cut it down many times a year and they went through that pain and then it managed to come back again. It had an enormous kind of sense of self and, and, and difficulty and struggle. And then for some reason, I imagined it and I thought of it as a children's book, but suddenly the blade of grass becomes aware of the field of grass, of all the grass all going through the same thing. And it felt the connectedness and it went down into its root system and realized it's not just a blade of grass, it's part of the earth. The whole earth is alive. It's all beneath it, supporting it, lifting it up, allowing it to grow. Yes, it gets cut back, but it grows again and it gets cut back and it grows again. And it learns to deal with this journey that one, it's not in it, it's not in this by itself. We're all in it together. And the blade of grass is a field of grass and it is the earth and it is a greenery that in many ways helps acknowledge the beauty of our lives and support our lives. I throw all this out to you because I'm trying to create the metaphors that we as human beings and blades of grass often feel very separated, cut off, alone, but we're really fields of grass and we really are connected to something in the earth and it is otherworldly. And I tell you, if you touch it, just touch it, it will speak to you. Now I've gone around my house and touched all the plants. So you should know they all speak differently. They are not all the same as the dahlia. Some of the plants are, they have thorny quality to them and they're not comfortable. Some are bristly. Some are really soft and lovely. They each have a language of their own. But what I'm trying to get at is the idea of touching life, going into it, feeling it, communicating with it, opens you up to a massiveness of being that most of us don't think about. We don't have a connection to. We're not aware of it. And I am here, you know, 60 years or so into the meditative experience, communicating with deep forces that I find amazing and hard to explain. But then I just touched a plant and at the age of 81, discovered a whole new world, a whole new alien world. And it's right there. So discovery isn't just from, you know, something that happened, you know, when you started meditating, it's ongoing and it is magical and it's beyond belief. And if you guys really go out there and touch a dahlia or whatever and see this thing, which is probably going to bloom again, which is like, you know, beyond my imagination because its bloom was so gorgeous. I was taking pictures of it endlessly when it was full, full flower. But all I can tell you is we live in this remarkable space and that we need to care for it as an external world and an interior universe. And if you do that, this kind of class that you're sitting in right now is a reminder, it's an energizer, it gives you information, it gives you an actual um, connection to something greater, and you're all welcome to it. And if you feel that there is another path for you, God bless, go for it. There's no need to think this is the one way. And if you start to own it as the one way, and I have seen people in this kind of practice do that, that's a problem. Because it's all going to get taken away, guys. Everything you know is going to get taken away. 
all your certainty, all your sense of, oh, this is how it is, evaporates or just lifts out of the, the equation and you're left with nothing. You don't know, not knowing anything. And, and again, I say this fairly often, you know, when they take everything away and you know nothing, you become lighter and lighter and lighter. And that, in my mind, is the door to enlightenment. So allow yourself not to know. Allow yourself to explore and feel and touch the world in a way you haven't done before. Touch plants, touch the grass, experience a blade of grass and what it goes through and then the lawn feels when it connects to itself. Try to understand how lucky we are as people to come together to find this spiritual connectivity that makes us a lawn, it makes us a whole living thing, and that we're all in it together and we're all stunningly fascinating and beautiful and amazing and remarkable, and we're very lucky to have each other. So those of you who don't know me yet, I talk a lot. So uh, I'm going to stop because that's the only way to end this. And I'm going to say, if anybody has questions, I'm open to talking here, answering questions. If some of you feel you need a private dialogue with me, I, I don't always find that I have the time, but I will try to make the time to have a private dialogue. But if you have a question now, please feel free to ask. And if you don't, then we just sign off. So I, I have two screens, so I have to go back and forth. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can just start talking. Uh, Virginia, go for it. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute the button. Put the push the unmute button because I can't hear you. There you yeah, go. I did. Yeah, hi Bruce. Thank you so much for this. It was my first time. Um, I have a question. I don't know if it's easy for you to answer, but basically, from what I understand, both like you and, for instance, uh, Ram Das, right? Uh, you're kind of born basically in. Um, would it be correct? J Judaism, right? T to some extent, even if it's more like um, secularized, but basically Jewish culture. Do you think it's some kind of generational thing or like, you know, finding finding more answers, if there are any at all, in Buddhism rather than the whatever religion, let's say, of your ancestors? I I'm Jewish too, or whatever, born Jewish. So I'm just curious about that. Um, I don't know if you could um, could respond. You were right saying secular Jew. Uh, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure about you. I don't know, but I'm just was saying that both relatively, you and Ram. Relatively, relatively mm -hmm. secular. Uh, I mean, I mm -hmm. raised Jewish and I certainly have that worldview and mm -hmm. a very good worldview for me. And I had mm -hmm. a sense of, uh, you know, of having a, a life that would take us to the Jewish temple on on occasions. We didn't go regularly. Certainly we were there for mm -hmm. about some one of the things I realized when I was there that nobody seemed to really be there, that everybody was looking at what people were wearing and they weren't really mm. much else. And I didn't feel nurtured by it exactly. Although during parts of my life, I just felt the, the arc, the arc of the of the covenant. I, I just I just felt a presence in the in that space that was really lovely. But uh, I wasn't looking anywhere else. I had, didn't understand other religions. And then as I've talked about so often, my LSD trip, which is a whole other conversation back in the 60s, shattered everything I ever knew about religion, practice, spirituality. Everything got thrown out the window. And that's when I had to begin searching for what, what did I experience? And I will make this very brief. What I had experienced is what's called the mystical core of every religion. So Buddhism talks about it, Hinduism, Judaism has mystical tradition, Christianity, you know, every, you know, every every religion has its its uh, deeper uh, expression of what we're trying to do in this class, really. But they have different avenues to get there. Uh, so I don't think that I particularly use my Judaism to get there, but it is a foundational part of my being, and I'm comfortable in it. Although, of course, I'm also especially nowadays, very challenged by how we're, our Jewish people are perceived. And, and I have a genetic sort of terror of how we have been perceived and, and, and how we've been treated over the course of centuries. So that's a built-in thing that I don't enjoy, but I have to deal with that. Other people don't have to deal with that. But, you know, I know you're from Russia and I know you've dealt with a lot of different, a lot of different uh, things. And uh, so all I can tell you is, 
your religion is a source of value. If you want to dig deep into it, if you want to look into the mystical side of it, you'll find it very valuable. If you get caught up in just the ritual of religion, you're just still caught in the outside world, and that world probably will fail you at some point unless it has somehow penetrated into the deeper core of your being, and then you will be served. Mm -hmm. okay. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I can't see you all, but um, now I'm seeing you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to just say thank you for coming. All the new people who came today, you know, um, God bless. You're welcome. You're welcome back. And uh, if I don't see you again, I wish you a great journey in this in this extreme, strange and extraordinary life that we're all that we're all we're all on. And uh, I just, I really just, uh, I truly love sitting with you. And, and not, none of you is leaving here today without a gift. Every one of you got something from this experience. So whether you are conscious of it or not, you can unwrap it over time and it will serve you. Thank you. Uh, now that we have more people in the class, I'm going to say, and I think I've said it before, we're not going to have to, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll still send out invitations to East Coast, West Coast for a while. But truly, um, uh, if you want to come to the class, just come. We'll make there will be we'll we'll work it out. Okay, we'll make room for everybody. Uh, and one last thing, because I've now recorded the introductory class for this practice, and it's online, uh, I can't just hand it out. But if you are interested. I'm talking to students who have been in the practice as well for a long time. If you want a refresher, just write me and I'll send you the link to it so you can watch the uh, class again. It's available to anybody who needs it. Thank you all. And thank you for helping me set all this up. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm really grateful for that. And uh, love you all and uh, be back next week. <laughs>